Um, we've missed you guys in the last week. Um, we're trying to make up this week. Uh, we have a couple of interesting topics. Um, it's been a little slow political week, but we still have some takes on, you know, some of the current events that's going on and probably go a little deeper dive into some of the topics. So we have a good show and we look forward to, you know, partaking our, not partaking, no, <laughs> relaying our message and our um, ideas with you guys today. How are we doing, everybody? Uh, not, not the biggest week. I mean, I feel like it's a hit or miss when it comes to the news. Like one week will be 15 major news items, and then this week is eh, more, more, more or less. I mean, we, we had a couple big things with like the, the UN Security Council voting on the ceasefire in Gaza, at, finally, because the US has been blocking, you know, vetoing time. Yeah. time. And finally, they just sort of abstained. They kind of gave up on at least pushing against it, which gave the UN the the, the green light to actually pass the the. I don't know what they're called. I don't even know if they have a way of authorizing these uh, or you know enacting any sort of. I don't know. I don't know how connected Israel is to the UN. That's all I'm saying. Do they actually have a, a way of enforcing anything? No, I don't think they're a permanent member. Um, I think only the US has that kind of big vote, swap the vote because they're permanent members, just like Russia and China is. So I don't really think they have that kind of sway in the UN, but I think it was a major setback because- I don't know that they have the sway in the UN, but does the UN have the sway over Israel? That's kind of what I'm saying. Can can this, like, this vote, oh, okay. does this vote actually enforce anything over Israel or is it just sort of like condemnation where they're like, bad? <laughs> I thought the vote was allowing a cease, allowing a ceasefire during Ramadan. Oh, right? it's only during Ramadan? I thought it was supposed to be like a long term or longer term thing, or at least like I don't know. I guess I'd not read too much into it. I just sort of watched John Stewart react to that. <laughs> yeah, I think when let me pull it up though. But yeah, um, I think it was because of the Ramadan. They were just still doing attacks on the Palestinian people. And <laughs> And they essentially kind of said, hey, you know, I'm going to attack people during Ramadan. It's like a religious holiday for them, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it's not like you should attack people just because it's not a holiday, but at least it's one step in the right direction. Yeah. But the problem is, you know, the, the issue that the White House has and the president has is just find this balance out between his base, between his bases. I mean, you're never gonna yeah. outright say, you know, the Israeli the Israeli people don't have a right to defend themselves. I think they do. And I yeah. think you know, no one can argue that. But the yeah, it's, it's it's an inconsistency for you to say that Israel is the right to defend itself, but like yeah. the innocent Palestinians don't, and at the same time, they're all Hamas if they stand up against Israel and they clearly don't care if they're Hamas or not. They're the majority of the casualties have been just completely innocent people, anyways. So this this yeah, conflict has to end. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's a very tough you know position the Biden administration's in, but it is a it's important. It's very important that they do take a very heavy stance against. Um, brutality by the Israeli yeah. army. Um, and I think that, you know, the abstain vote was a good vote because it showed that there are limitations that we have in towards the treatment of Palestinian yeah. people. And I think that it was a loud message sent to Israel to know that, hey, we support you, but with limitations. And and I think it was a good thing. It was the right thing for the president to do. Yeah, because up until this point, Israel's basically had a green light to do anything and they can get away with it because uh, Biden's been pretty weak on, you know, pushing back against Netanyahu up until very recently. Netanyahu mm -hmm. is far right. Just because he's um, just because he's Jewish doesn't mean he's not a Nazi. Like he's as close to being a Nazi, a fascist as he could be ideologically he just believes in imperialism expansionism nativism 
He doesn't. He's, he's anti-Islam. He, he, he heavily mil, militaristic, obviously. Not too uh, concerned about civilian casualties, and it, it has to end. It's 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 pretty clear, and they don't care about Hamas. They are, it's it's as close to a genocide as you can get. They're clearly just trying trying to eliminate the uh, the Palestinian population so that they can expand their their territory onto the ruins of what was once Gaza and what was once Muslim property. You know what I mean? Just because that the 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 Jewish people or the Israeli people had a historical tie to the land doesn't mean the Arabs didn't as well, and they're a much closer tie. They were living there not five seconds ago before you blew it up. This this sort of nativist ideology that's been a part of every single you know society and pretty much in human history is like a it's a cancerous it's it's it's, it's not very intellectual. It's like you're born on a piece of dan- sand, so therefore you are you are me. You are like me, but then you're born a little bit farther away. Then you must like you have lesser value than somebody close to me. I, I mean, I'm I'm more concerned about somebody you know their values and the kind of person that they are. And, you know, there's good people in every single country and hardworking people that don't give a shit about geopolitics and or any of that stuff. You know, people are so hyper fixated on their own problems and their own fears that they project them onto every other person in the entire planet. That's not them. That's an out. That's, that's easy to when they're not in their in group. And that's just all of politics essentially broken down. Yeah. It's I just think in group out group. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I really think what we're seeing is just a crisis. The Israelite, the Israeli government using a crisis to move an agenda ahead. So I believe identical to uh, uh, 9/11, in my opinion. Very identical. Yeah. They saw that there was a rallying cry of a nation wanting something to be done by the actions of the Palestinian. <laughs> by the Hamas yeah. uh, organization within the Palestinian community. And they took that to say that, okay, we're going to completely just wipe out Gaza. Yeah. Stands, and we're going to make... Because every Palestinian it. has ties to Hamas, in their view. In so, their view. Which is pretty... Uh, I mean, it's pretty blatant what they're calling for. But they, they're, they you get attacked for calling it genocide because, I don't know, because they have good PR. That's, that's yeah. yeah, and it's it's politics, really. It's taking an opportunity, a crisis, and essentially going about it as a way to extend an agenda that's been going on for 30, 40 years. Yeah. To completely wipe out a group of people so that you can have 100% rights to a land. That yeah. was really given to you by yeah. Europeans. It was given to you by people who had also had no right to the land. Exactly. The imperialists gave it to other imperial imperialists. And you know, the fact that Israel exists now, that's fine. You know, those people have been there for their entire lives, entire generations. There's no way we could get we would want to even get rid of them off of Israeli territory because it was once Palestinian territory because then we're just repeating the exact same problem that we just came from. So maybe just like leave people alone and, you know, let them live on the land that there's, that's their land. And you don't really have a right to it just because you're related to some person who once lived, lived there. Like if you really break it down, it's just silly how, how people are willing to sacrifice tens of thousands of lives over just random ass border disputes, you know? It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Is there, uh, like I said, the government is using an opportunity against the people, and we haven't said enough. When I say we, I say, you know, Americans, that, hey, we understand that they were attacked, but we also understand that we have a responsibility to a group of people to protect their children and their loved ones. Yeah. And I think that we are finally getting that message across to the administration that this is important because I believe right now Biden has, if not the most, um, what's that principal call that they're doing right now? 
They're kind of voting against a no candidate vote. Yeah. Um, the uncommitted? Non-committed vote, yes. So it's a kind of a movement where essentially yeah. people go in to vote knowing that Biden is going to win, but they essentially vote non-committed so they can protest against the, well, any kind of protest, but this one in particular is about the brutality. There's the Israeli government is going against the Palestinian people. Yeah, it's basically the best way of showing Biden, like, we are we are Democratic voters, and there's this many Democratic voters that you're going to lose if you don't change your position, your stances on Israel. And you know it's pretty pathetic that that's what it took. And but he he's 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 not going to get reelected if it's, if he loses Michigan, if he loses Minnesota. At least he can see the writing on the wall. Eventually, you know, it took him forever, but at least he's finally seen what's best for him. You know, even if he doesn't care about what's good for the Palestinians, at least he's looking at his own self-interest because that's going to help. <laughs> it's going to help him too. It's, gonna, it's hurting him. It's hurting Palestinians. It's hurting Israelis. It, it's hurting everybody. Just continuing the policies that they've been doing. Absolutely no winners in this situation. So you know, it took his own self-interest to make a move. But sure, you know, at least we're finally doing something to prevent more civilian deaths and casualties, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and uh, we're doing something, and I and I look forward to seeing what we're gonna do in the coming weeks, in regards to putting more force on the Israeli government, so that we can find a solution. I mean, we cannot have an endless war in Gaza. No, uh, we just cannot. We have to find a way to tone down the war fighting and start the dialoguing to try to get some kind of consensus going forward because we cannot essentially say that the Israel mandate of wiping out Gaza is an option. That's not going to be an option. Yeah, We have to say that, hey, Gaza is a group of people. They deserve to have their lands respected and we need to find a solution where you guys can live in peace and harmony. And it's our responsibility because we have the most power and influence yeah. over Israel. And civilian casualties aside, it's not even a good strategy for Israel because, first of all, they're wasting endless resources. And they're they're not going to defeat Hamas because Hamas is not, or at least Palestinian, you know, liberation is not a concept that you can defeat with force. You know, you, if anything, the force is what is perpetuating its acceleration. You know what I mean? You're just creating new generations of people who hate Israel and want to hurt Israel because Israel hurt them. Israel killed all of their friends and family and destroyed their land. You know what I mean? So regardless of how many in innocent people there are in Israel who had nothing to do with Netanyahu's government, they're just inviting future terrorism, not just from Palestine or Hamas, but from Iran, from all these other neighboring countries that already have a vested interest in seeing Israel destroyed. So, Yeah. It's it's really bad, and we got to do something about it. Um, in other news, I'm looking at Flo uh, Florida, our governor. You know that he banned um, yeah social media for under fourteen. Social media olds. for what is it? Fourteen year olds and under. Yeah, that's absolutely okay. wild. I mean, like, it's not an enforceable thing, really. I guess I don't know. It just seems it just seems weird, and like, to the extent that he's inviting the federal government to in, in, interfere in your personal lives. You know what I mean? The, the small yeah. government guy is going to be like, "What? Now we're going to be filtering through people's Instagrams, being like, oh, this mother, this mother with her, uh, their, her Instagram account where she has a lot of pictures of her son.'" We're investigating to see if this is actually a child's Instagram account, and you're going to lose your account because you have too many pictures of your son. You know, is this really his account? Like, you know what I mean? Like, to what extent are they going to be able to enforce that? They're going to have like government officials looking through Instagram trying to find, <laughs> you know, underage social media accounts with only within the parameters of Florida. Like, this is some, this is some like SS shit, man. Gustavo, like. <laughs> they're just in inviting way too much power to give to state and local governments 
which has always been like the ideals of the Republican Party. They don't care about small government. They care about local localized tyranny because they have a majority of the power when it comes to individual localities. So if you go, you know, county to county, there's way more Republican controlled areas. So then if you, if you give all the power to individual localities the Republicans dominate, that's their only way because they've never had a majority, of, you know, the, the voting base. When was the last time they won the popular vote vote 2004? So yeah. it's their only winning strategy is, is to create authoritarianism at the local level and to give more power to counties and school or parents, more power over like school boards, all this sort of stuff, less, less liberalism in our, in our public schools. We need to bring back God and prayer and school and all this individualized authoritarian stuff that I've had witnessed in my childhood that I know conservatives have been have ambitions for their entire lives. They don't care about small government. They just care about anti-liberal values and that liberalism they view as being protected by the government, which is the role of government to protect liberty and, you know, protect my right to freedom of religion, my right to freedom of speech, your right to uh, assemble, all these sort of things, which conservatives claim to be for, but really uh, oppose. You know, they don't believe in any of that stuff. They just believe it when it protects Christians. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the Republican playbook, you know, divide and conquer. Uh, the reality is that the whole banning of the, of speech of 14-year-olds, there's no way to enforce it. Yeah. And if they were to enforce it, it'd be a lot of it would be unconstitutional. And I think there was someone that said earlier that this attempt of a bill has been tried and passed several other states and there's the Supreme Court have always rejected it. So they don't even think this bill is going to be constitutional when it gets challenged in the courts. So it's just another playbook by DeSantis to get media attention by creating more sensationalism so that he gets his name talked about in the media but in reality, it's not an actual effective bill that would actually do anything in the state. You know, and that kind of brings me to that point that we have to find a way to start screening these politicians from that, where they pass these bills and, and create this idea of success that have passed so many bills. Yeah. Really have zero little impact on people's individual lives politics has just become more and more just become like a theater you know what i mean everybody's yeah. just performing and the real work is done by like aides you know congressional aides in the legislative and it, it's only usually specifically when it comes to leadership too because only the leadership is the one that actually decides everything that passes so the more and more that power is becoming centralized in our government and becoming less democratic, which it, it has been pretty, uh, I mean, up until Biden administration, it's been like at its lowest democratic point since, mm -hmm. uh, I can't even think of the last time, maybe Nixon, uh, even, even farther, worse, worse than Nixon, farther back than that. So it's just been like an unprecedented wave of populism leaning towards, you know, authoritarianism, right wing specifically. I mean, there's been a left wing populist rise too, but it's not institutionalized and there's no power really, especially in the United States. So this right wing movement is, is not just a United States problem either. This has been a global issue. It's been growing in Brazil. It's growing in Argentina. All these countries are electing far right leaders with dictatorial ambitions. It's rising right now in Germany. Germany is, uh, you know, this, they've been ruled by Olaf, forgot his last name, sh something. Sh either way, he's the Social Democratic Party leader. So they've, yeah. they've got a left-wing government right now, but right now their AFD is polling at 36%. They're the number one party in the in the Germany, and they are literally a far-right party. Like, it's not like a... a, a uh, and insults, they're like self-described as a far-right party. And we all know what that means in Germany. And they're not even the only Nazi party in Germany with, you know, institutional power. There's a new, I can't remember what they're called because it's a brand new political party with far-left economic opinions and far-right social views. So they're just the new national Bolsheviks. Literally, 
they've been suppressed for all these years. And all of a sudden, 2016, far right movements all across the world have been growing in yeah. every single country. And I think Trump is a catalyst. He's like the literal antichrist. He's like the resurgence of global Nazism, even though he's not 100 percent on board with that. But he's a catalyst for everybody's right wing populist, far right national conservative ambitions, which yeah. is basically just a it's, it's a farther version of conservatism than the classical liberal Republican conservatism that we've experienced, you know, in the last 20 years where they just talk about small government, low taxes, all this sort of stuff. No, this this is a farther conservative. This is just before we had a d democratic system. This is autocracy. This is the feudal system resurging. You know, we want to centralize power amongst the elites and we want to, yeah. you know, replace all the liberal establishment, the coastal elites with people who agree with these specific right-wing Christian nationalist ideological perspective. So yeah. they're just doing a, a U.S. coup. They're doing coups in all over the world, just installing mm -hmm. right-wing governments and far-right movements. In France, Marine Le Pen is more popular than she, she's ever been. Macron is like this neoliberal center-right lib liberalist you know everything that's that they don't believe in anymore in the rest of the world like he's the tonight kind of political perspective and he's like every single year is becoming less less popular in france just leading towards you know the opposition being more popular some of macron yeah macron which is just leading to a far-right movement in france so all of europe has got this major far-right bend to it that's just been resurging in the last 10 years and I don't want to see how this ends, you know? I mean, it's going to end like it always ends. They're going to go too far. Yeah. They're going to go too extreme with it. It's going to cripple every single economy. And then people are going to swing back to the left. Yeah. <laughs> That's what people love. I mean, people love rhetoric. Yeah. And people underestimate that a lot. They underestimate someone's ability people to People love it. oppositional rhetoric. Yeah. Which is why we always experience the bounce in between the left and the right. It's because mm -hmm. easy, it's so much easier to shit on your opponents than it is to promise and follow the their promises. Yeah, it's it's so it's so easier to do that than to govern. Yeah. And and that's what's really the problem. It's like, yeah, far right's moving, winning right now because the reality is people want to find a. Um, how do I say? It? People would have want to find a scapegoat for the way the condition is, and the reality is, the way the way that people lives are right now are is a direct impact on elitism. It's yeah. there's there's no way around it. Like you could put a Democrat or you could put a Republican in office, and you'll still get some elitism. Yeah, um, because that comes, the elitism comes with a power. And power is institutionalized. So when then you become a part of the institution, you become part of the elites. And, you know, you're expected to adhere to a certain professionalism. You know, John F Fetterman being forced to wear a suit. You're forced into this sort of elitist circle. And, you know, after, after being a, a senator for however many years, you just sort of become like everybody else. You know what I mean? You become the new establishment. It's just something that's inherent to power and the centralization of power which is why power should be as decentralized as possible you know we need a, a centralized force alongside democracy so we can make decisions but at the end of the day like i shouldn't make decisions about your personal life you shouldn't make decisions about my personal life but if you know private institutions are controlling people making decisions about their personal lives controlling government stuff like that then government has a responsibility to, to jump in so it's like an inherent cycle between who is holding the more power, the private institutions or the public institutions. And wherever the power ends up going, it, the power ends up corrupting the institutions. So we're kind of in an endless cycle, bouncing between left and right, between all these issues, because it's like the issue is power in general. I agree. And yeah. the the issue with power is that we we love to abdicate it we love to give it up yeah and we do that because we don't want to make the hard decisions and we think that 
a handful of capable people can make those decisions. But then so, you realize your opposition is completely incompetent. So then letting go of power would be to be enabling their political opinions. And that makes you fearful and, you know, makes you act more authoritarian and more power hungry because you're, you're so sure that you are the one that's, that's the anti-authoritarian that's going to protect the people. But you, by doing so, you are preventing or you're fighting against the democratic institutions in general because you're afraid of some anti-democrat. It's it's all cycle. Everything's cyclical. Your fear is the thing that corrupts you as a you know a credible representative of the people in general. Mm-hmm. So you know the fear of the opposition always turns you know good into evil. You know what I mean? People only good only bad things are done with good intentions. You know or bad things are always done when people think that they're doing the right thing and they think that they need to cut corners in certain ways that are that other people wouldn't understand and it's really for the greater good but at the end of the day they're the bad guys doing bad things because they think their ambitions are more important than the people that they harm yeah i 100 percent agree with that assessment i think that most people focus on you know what can I do that's positive that doesn't hurt me? Well, what happens is when you have that mentality and you're doing something that's positive that doesn't hurt you, mm-hmm. you realize what well, you don't realize is unintentionally you're hurting people. Yeah. Because there's no way you can really make effective change without making a sacrifice for yourself. And so I see that that's what our biggest issue is that a lot of politicians that come into office and what happens is they have this great intention of really making some effective change. Mm-hmm. But then what ends up happening is their intentions of making that change is jaded by the ability to stay in power. Yeah, exactly. And so what happens is because it's like so, I can't I can't follow through on my change if I lose my power. So I have to focus more on staying in power. And then and then the entire game is just about power and not about actually following through with your ambitions and your you know your goals for society. And, you know, if, if maybe we didn't offer so much power, power, we offer less power and it's more delegated widely, then people wouldn't be able to grasp power or that wouldn't be the main goal of, you know, power moving society in a certain direction. If it was more democratic, then it's harder to have smaller groups have more power. You know what I mean? There's more consensus and, you know, the actual ways of dis- changing the minds of societies are more important and you have to do it in a more catered way because you have to actually unite the country in order to pass something. That's like the democratic ideal. That's why they thought of things like the filibuster because you, you wanted a society to be more on the same page for them to all agree on something. A majority rules. We move society in this direction. But as society is moving forward and misinformation is growing more and more because of the way the internet is moving, we're moving farther and farther apart. So dem- democracy is like a more more harm than it's ever been but at the same time people have more access to the truth than they've ever had so everything is moving in such a bipolar direction that like it's it's completely unpredictable which way we end up going so i read so it's funny you said that because i read i was watching this video over the weekend Mm -hmm. it was about um i do weird things like that i watch (laughs) videos about like um i was watching this video about um information theory mm-hmm. and i know a lot of people are not fans of elon musk um yeah on twitter he's pretty but dumb. twitter but he did say something that was he was saying that we need to stop trying to create more computer science majors mm-hmm. and start focusing on creating more information technology majors yeah um, and i not excuse me not information technology but i meant to say um information theory majors Hmm. And I was puzzled by that because I didn't know what information theory was. Yeah. And then so what I ended up doing was researching what information theory was. And it's come to find out it's about this, I um, can't think of his last name, but it's a scientist. Uh, I believe it starts with Alan's his first name. I couldn't think of his last name. But he had an interesting theory. And essentially what he said was that information is knowledge and information is another way of saying intelligence. Yeah. 
So what ended up happening is when you have too much information brought into you, which is too much intelligence, it becomes noise. And so our society, I think what happens is we have so much information coming out with us that there's just so much noise that we don't know how to discern that information. Was the guy Alan Watts? I believe it was Alan Watts, yeah. Oh, I oh Jesse, you got to get into Alan Watts. I am obsessed yeah. with it. He's like shaped like my entire perspective. So you got you to go. No, no, no. Hold on, wait. It may not have been Alan Watts. He's an English writer, philosophy entertainer. That sounds like Alan Watts. When it was in the when... I was thinking of um, information theory. Let it me... sounds like something Alan wants to say too. So, his name was Shannon. What's his oh. last name? His first name, Alan. I think it was Alan Shannon. Oh, okay, okay. Oh no! Wait, wait, wait! No, I could be wrong. His first name was not Alan. Maybe that's why we're. I'm off. Maybe you just made that part up. Claude. E. Shannon, it's his real name. Okay. So sorry. Still looking, still looking at you once. Claude, Claude, Claude or Allen, it's you know relatively close. Yeah. <laughs> or not. <laughs> uh, but essentially, well, what essentially is he was saying is that the more information that you take in, the more noise it becomes. And this is apparent in everything that we do from computers. You know, taking information, humans taking information from each other, humans taking information from Facebook, social media, computers. The more information that we take in, the harder it is for us to discern that information. Yeah. And it's very true. Even when I'm practicing the law, I know if I'm going to try to explain a complex topic, it be it's very hard to communicate a complex topic with someone. Mm. So when I think of when I present my argument in front of like a jury or a judge. I've really simpled down what I'm trying to say into something like a common person would understand. Yeah. Because that's just effective communication. You can't bog people down with a lot of jargon to yeah. words. You gotta make it more simple. Lawyer and jargon so, is not exactly the easiest language to understand. That is true. Um, every profession has that. Doctors, yeah. lawyers, we all have that kind of thing, which is hard. But for the most part, just putting in a lot of information to people's, you know, in front of their face makes people shut down because they don't understand a lot of it, you know, and it takes a while to break down everything and understand these concepts. So what a lot of politicians do is, you know, they come in and they say, well, I'm going to do something, but then they can't really explain what they're really doing because they're just blowing out a whole bunch of information, but those information doesn't really connect with people because the reality they're not they're not saying what really can affect that person's particular life. So my theory is just that I feel like we as humans should have some kind of like app focus, basic focus. Like kind of like it's weird. Like um how would I explain it? So let, let's say we have a bill, right? That you know comes into play and then your congressman wants to vote on it. We should allocate a budget so that these our politicians who are our elected officials should be able to upload the information on the app. It's like, hey, this is what this bill is saying. And let me break this down to something where it's my perspective. This is the opposing party's perspective. What do you think? Yeah, this reminds me of um, Justin Amash. He was my representative in Michigan. He's actually the only third party member to ever be in Congress uh, uh, in modern times, the Libertarian Party. Um, but he used to be, I used to really admire this about him. He was before like social media was really dominating. He used to write down every single um, thing that he voted on on Facebook. And he would write a big, long explanation on exactly why he voted for every single thing in the details of the bill. And it was very transparent. And it was, it was why he got reelected year after year, despite being very divergent from the contemporary Republican Party. And he's also running for Senate in Michigan under Republican. He, he left the Libertarian Party to run for Senate as a Republican, which is interesting. I, I, I mean, I want him over in the other Republicans, hands down, because he's actually an honorable person. He's also a Palestinian American, which is oh, interesting. Wow. He's, he's like the he's like the most non-interventionist on foreign policy, like probably in in Congress at the time. So he's also mm -hmm. super, you know, 
not a fan of us giving money to Israel, despite being a Republican, you know, and a, a Palestinian. So it's it's yeah. all it's, there's a lot going on there. But he's a very interesting character. But anyways, yeah, I respect the transparent think, process like that. No, I, I I've heard of him, and I he's very uh, when he well he was very popular for a minute there, and then he kind of disappeared off the radar a little bit. Yeah, but he was popular, for, and I've. I did hear a lot of his rhetoric, and I thought right. that he had some good ideas. He's very, but, intelligent, very respectful person. Best, one of the best Republicans yeah. that ever existed. <laughs> ever existed. Yeah. A low uh, bar. I don't know. I get it's, oh. it's a low bar. Are we, still, are we still taking our bets on Mitt Romney? Like, if he's going to jump in or not? He's 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 he retired from Congress because he's too old. I don't think he's going to um, run for president. He's he's think, also too like principled as a person that like and he's he, I don't think he's really like a grifter the same way I'm sh like I believe that he believes what he believes even if he's wrong you know what I mean you're probably right he's seventy seven I think that's gonna be oh, tough seventy seven I didn't know he was that old wow yeah I th I knew he was like probably seventy and he was retiring but that's yeah yeah no he's probably not oh, let's take let's take let's take betting odds Jesse. <laughs> I'm gonna recant my bet. Right. But I would I find it interesting that he's from Detroit, Michigan. You never said that. Well, George Romney was the governor of Michigan. Oh, his dad was the governor. Yeah, his dad was his dad was the governor of Michigan during like the civil rights movement. And he was actually a really good Republican, you know, as far as they go. And as with the civil rights movement, he was really pro civil rights, especially in the fifties, which is, you know. <laughs> That's really so radical. It's really radical for a Republican. I mean, I guess Dwight Eisenhower is not too far off. He desegregated public schools and stuff like that. He wasn't ideal for sure, but you know, that's a different. That's the kind of Republican that we need. You know, we need that, yeah. party, that party back. No, I agree. We do. Um, I'm just thinking, what was he the governor of again? Who uh, Mitt Romney? He was the governor of Massachusetts. I assume yeah. because he went to school there or something like that. But then yeah. he moved to Utah because he's a Mormon. Yeah, and he became the senator <laughs> of Utah. Even though he didn't have any real ties to Utah, he just decided to establish his residency there. And then two years later, he ran for the Senate, which is a little grifty, sure, because that's the yeah, only but he's, he's like the, the most popular Mormon of all time, isn't he? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah, he's like a living legend there. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah he ran till he's... The what I say, he could have ran for office until his death there, for sure. Yeah, but he, like, you know, he, he knew he knew the right thing to do, and he he's decided to retire. He's not even yeah. he's not even like Mitch McConnell, who is like literally mentally incompetent at this point. He's retiring though, Mitch, right? Yeah, he has he like can barely function as an adult. He's even worse than Biden. Yeah, he's done. Yeah. Well, this might be a big change of the guard. This. Mm -hmm. I don't see Mitt. If Mitt Mingo, McConnell, Nancy Pelosi's gone. But you know, she's not retiring, is she? She's not in leadership anymore. She's not in leadership, but I think she's Which is the stay. important part. And yeah, Nancy Pelosi's gonna die. You know, now Marjorie Taylor Greene is talking about she wants to get rid of um Mike Johnson, so who knows how long he's gonna last. I don't know. I, I think he's gonna stick around for a minute because he seems mostly popular amongst Republicans, but Republicans are unhinged, so they could turn on him in a, at any minute. I don't know. I think people like Marjorie Taylor Greene needs to. I don't. She's probably gonna win her seat forever. Yeah. But someone like that's never gonna go anywhere, anywhere for outside her seat. No, I don't think so either. I don't think she'll. Maybe she'll be in part of an, an administration or something in the future. But you know, she's more of a influencer than anything. You know, the far right kind of like is it's the Georgia. I think fourteenth. Some some oh. super far right district. Oh, it's got to be super conservative. Yeah, it is. Oh, she's right outside Atlanta. That is very shocking. Is it really? It's probably the, the far right suburbs where all the rich white people in Atlanta avoid the uh, the rest of the population. Maybe, but it's not both. almost certain. Almost, I don't even have to look it up. I know it is. I know she she's is. Probably in the suburbs. There's no other. Yeah, yeah, she's in the suburbs. There's no way she can. Yeah. She can never win a, in a city. <laughs> she got to stick to her little. Like I don't. 
good hope. I, I can't imagine a single non-white person could vote for her. I mean, she's like the, she's the prototypical. I'm a farm girl. I'm down in. She's the Confederate. De- yeah, <laughs> she's a descendant. It's a, exactly. It's like, like I'm a proud Confederate. <laughs> it's like. Yeah, you know, like, is this, if this was America 1940, you probably had a shot at the presidency. <laughs> oh yeah, except she's a woman. So no. well, that's true too. Because the Confederate, <laughs> <Confederate laughs> <Confederate laughs> <Confederate laughs> her idea. <laughs> she's George. Is it George Wallace? Yeah, George Wallace. George yeah, Wallace. Wallace. He's the racist he's one. Yeah, yeah, George Wallace reincarnated. Yeah, but yeah. no, first the Confederates would never vote for a woman. A woman. <laughs> a woman. Her role is in the kitchen. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, that's the Confederates for you. It's like, don't you know, it's nothing yeah. but the white man and the white Southern man that should dictate the, the role of the country. <laughs> it just goes to show that these people never really went away. Yeah, of course. And there's something true about what conservatives say when it comes to like media bias or something yes. like that. Because we really, you know, have pretended like the far right isn't a sizable minority pretty much the entire time America has existed. You know what I mean? They never went away. They just lost institutional power, which is why it's fair for conservatives to feel alienated and like the liberals are running everything and they have all the institutional power and all that sort of stuff. And they're preventing Donald Trump from running. It's understandable how they can have that perspective because, you know, the United States is a liberal country. Look, I disagree with that. I think that no, I think they're stupid. I just think yeah. I understand where they're coming from from a far right perspective. No, I you say know, what if you're in the, if you're in those shoes and all the institutions are against you, if it's pretty hard for you to have an objective opinion on the situation. Well, I agree, but what I what I the part I disagree on is the the fact that I have a lot of Republican conservative friends. You know, I Democrat. Yeah. And you know, I have Republican conservative friends who like to shoot, you know, who go shooting and and mm-hmm. I, Sure. And so that doesn't have to because you're conservative doesn't mean you have to be you know how I say uh, uh, I don't want to say racist but that's the this is the word I'm using because I don't have any other word but there's a lot of different motivations yeah, yeah. I feel like non non politically active Republicans the sort of ones that just sort of grow up in the area and they have conservative values all exactly. of them are. You know, they don't, they don't live their day-to-day life as a racist, exactly. you know what I mean? But they are also racially ignorant and probably don't live around a lot of other diverse backgrounds. And so they'll have prejudiced opinions based on only being around their angry bias. So, you know, they'll, 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 they could act racist without having racist, racist, and racist intentions, but that's kind of how racism has moved. I mean, there still are very straight-up blatant racists in the United States and obviously in Europe, you know where they don't have a sizable minority race yeah. at all. You know what I mean? So that's why fascism is on a rise is because immigration is, uh, you know, part of the liberal ideology is global globalism, global immigration and multiculturalism. So as all these sort of liberal governments in Europe, liberal to socialist leaning governments, you know, the all the progressive governments in Western Europe, are having a lot of immigration and refugees from all the sorts of different yeah. countries that have, you know, non-white, non-European descents. And all of a sudden racism's on the rise again. Big shocker. Nativism is, you know, playing a key role in politics as it always has. People think that for some reason, if you're born in the same land and watch the same TV shows and went to the same kind of schools, that, that makes you a, a more valuable person or somebody that's more worth being well, around. Right. When it's it's not, a fallacy. It's a and, fallacy of argument that that, that mindset. Yeah. And I think you're going to that the fallacy of that. But I just want to come in before yeah. it. Uh, essentially, it, it, this whole idea that some conservative Republicans bring out, like, oh, you know, a minority would take my job, black, Latino, whatever, whatever minority yeah. you want to say, they're gonna take my job and stuff like that. It, it, it's just phallus because the reality is before Europeans even knew about Africans and minorities, they were fighting each other mm-hmm. for centuries. <laughs> it's like for yeah. centuries, European. It doesn't even have to be a racial well, thing. It's still, like yeah. I said, as everything is in group, out group. If you aren't abiding to the same ideas as me, if you aren't, 
the whole key is tolerance to an extent, but I mean, it's also like acceptance of people for their inherent qualities, not their ideas, mm -hmm. but you know, just having somebody that thinks differently from you being so threatening to your own values that you feel like you need to prevent them from being near you or have any sort of equal say to you is the key fears is the key to authoritarianism. And that's pretty much the key to conservative ideology is like fear. Mm -hmm conservatism is just based on fear of things changing against the way that I currently like, like it. And, you know, I, I have a fear of us moving in a direction that I become the conservative, but you know, it's a better alternative than what we have now. It's a situation in which we become so ultra progressive that like, I feel like I need to conserve the values that my crunch has stood for. That's at least a good thing. You know what yeah. I mean? The, the problem is always in backsliding, you know, that's where all the violence comes from. Because like I've said, progress can only happen incrementally. You really can't change a society to move a society forward without some sort of change and some sort of people being able to settle into a new system. While fascist coups and, you know, movements have always required heavy amounts of force and backsliding. And, you know, it doesn't take a, an easy system. You always have to do it by, you know, forcing values down other people's throats. It's inherent to the system of right-wing ideologies is non-acceptance. Liberalism is acceptance, well, acceptance of different cultures and multiculturalism. Conservatism is you, you have to be forcefully aligned with this, the values of this country. What, and they always talk about individualism. What is more collectivist than that? Yeah that you can't think freely for yourself in this own country. We have to be a country that forces a certain ideology, a Christian nationalist, which is what they've been talking about. Christian nationalism, American. America should be a Christian nation. All, everything that, that follows that is purely authoritarianism. Yeah. So I'm, I don't know how long the Republican party could claim to be a party of freedom, like before everybody sort of catches on that that's com they're completely opposite perspectives yeah. you know you can't have freedom for some without freedom for all that's true well so i mean and that's i mean racism is never going to just go away overnight i mean someone mm -hmm. i can just speak for my experience uh with racism and i think that we as a country doing a lot better than we did in 1960 but i think trump was the last um well, I don't, I'm not going to say Trump's a racist because I don't really know him like that. Trump's racist. But his rhetoric is racist. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to, um, to to have racist rhetoric as a non-racist person. That's just my Yeah, opinion. but I'm a lawyer, so I'm very... <laughs> I get it. I don't mean Trump's going to you for calling him racist, but yeah, I get it. I understand yeah. your perspective. Um, uh, sorry, did, I, you, very, you really called out that Lori, that Lori talk just now. <laughs> but yeah, so... Yeah, so the rhetoric talk, the red, the, re the racism that he uses in his rhetoric, is, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think it brought out a lot of the last, which tend to be older. Yeah. <laughs> um, last. The last wave of racism within, you know, the American. Yes. But the thing is, all the people that are big Trump is Trump's biggest supporters are people that are born in the '30s and '40s. Yeah, exactly. It's the last little bit of it. That's your point. Is like they're they're the last wave inherently because they're going to be dead within the next two presidential cycles. Yeah. You know, the sort of racist behavior is literally going to die yeah. off unless Trump creates a new generation of young little racist boys, little fourteen-year-olds who think they're cocky, edgy, you know, masculine alpha yeah. types who think that they can just say whatever the fuck they want because you know is America and freedom and Trump didn't Trump is being discriminated against and white men are being discriminated against because they want equality and shit like this. This is the, 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 the scary fork and road that is a potential, but I don't, I'm not, I don't really think big picture. We're going to ever move in that direction. No. I do think society is going to figure itself out, even if it takes a few rough turns before. It yeah. I think, I think that um, I look forward to seeing the election this year. Because it's going to tell me if Trump mm -hmm. loses really badly, it's going to tell you the direction yeah. that we're going as a country. Because every single 
Well, not every single one of them, but majority of the people he picked to win in the last four years have all done that. Done yeah. Very poor. Yeah. He literally, he's only won in 2016, and everything else has been just L after L. Other than, you know, the Supreme Court being forced con- towards a conservative end so that they've been getting some – some things passed by the Supreme Court, but the legislation has not been a very successful thing for them, as well as the presidency. Nothing really worked for the Republicans, yeah. and they don't have much of a winning message. And, you know, after this is, if they do lose by, like, a large margin, it, it's really, even a larger margin than last time, it would be really, really hard to defend the idea that conservatism is still the majority and it's all just a rigged election. It's not because it's reflecting the opinions of the American populace. I am concerned about a close election, though, because that's just going to continue the same old shit that we've seen for the last four years about, oh, the liberals are in charge and conservatives are being discriminated against and, you know, they're throwing away our ballots and they're, you know, oh, they're changing the rules so fast so that they can win and they're inviting immigrants who will only vote for Democrats and all this sort of yeah. stuff. Republicans are always projecting on the immigration issue because they think Republican or Democrats care about immigration because of voting demographics. Even though we already have the majority of the American people, as if we need more people to be uh, Democrats, as if it wasn't more of a voter suppression issue, they are concerned about immigration turning the tides against Republicans because the Republicans are a white majority party. Yeah. So, you know, once they're immigrants who are obviously going to vote for Democrats who would support immigration don't discriminate against people of color. So they're obviously going to vote for them. So they're, all their concerns about immigration are just about maintaining power. While Democrats are believe in immigration because of moral reasons. So they're always like, they're projecting their values, their reason for being against immigration onto Democrats who have a completely different reason for having a moral virtue of you know, people having the freedom of movement. So uh, it's just, uh, it just really shows their, their real values. And they're, you know, I do think that Republicans have a racist bent toward them, but I think that that isn't purely based in racism anymore. I think it's based in power. Well, I think that at one point it was based in just purely hating people of color. I think they've moved towards a place where they hate people of color because people of color are the ones that are going to go against their values more likely and they're more likely to vote for democrats who are liberal and are more likely to support all the things that they don't support therefore they project all their fears onto immigrants and onto people of color because they are they're the liberals they're changing our way of living and their lgbtq in our children and all the sort of fear that they have they can project onto somebody else it's they're not the in group they don't look like me they're brown so it's just so much easier for them to just make people of color a scapegoat instead of seeing the real problems in the society, which is, you know, being closed minded towards people of entire groups and grouping people in together like that based on identity, which is exactly what they're doing. No, I agree with you. I, you said. Sorry for that going in 10 different directions. No, no, I, you said and cut you off because I think everything you said is 100 percent on point. I mean, yeah. They're gonna have a problem in the next couple of years because at the end of the day, if your rhetoric is driven by your ability to divide, when you have nobody on your side to divide yeah, it, exactly, it doesn't make sense, you know, it doesn't make sense. At one point, it was just about maintaining the majority, and now since they aren't the majority, it's like, how do we divide the ma- the majority which is already against us? Which is why I do kind of still think RFK was a uh, originally a like Manchurian candidate kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I thought he, I think he was like a Republican who played used the Kennedy name to run as a Democrat to take votes away from Biden. And then he got power hungry and he liked the attention. So now he just sort of went renegade and ran as an independent. And now he's taking votes from Trump. So it's funny. Um, well, it's funny you say that because I was just reading an article that says he's going to pick his VP. Oh, yeah. Which- tomorrow i'm pretty sure i already know who it is it's she's like an it's it seems pretty clear from all my indications that it's some like billionaire's ex-wife who is a major donor and supporter of kennedy so he's just picking a loyalist at the end of the day instead of somebody with name recognition that could either hurt or harm his ticket he's just picking somebody that's more of a wash it's a woman sure and she's 
marginally younger than every other person announced other than maybe Kamala. But uh, Nicole is Sanderson? Yeah, exactly. So I feel like she's more or less gonna do nothing to his ticket. He's gonna do a whole Sailor Palin thing, huh? Do a whole what? Sarah Palin thing. Oh, kinda. Except Sarah Palin had at least some sort of institutional power. This is a completely no name person with no real power, except for probably the ability to raise money and <laughs> have That's sort of you know, networking <laughs> power and stuff. So, I don't think that's going to help his ticket. He need to get more of an establishment guy. That's what I'm thinking too. Although his whole thing is being anti-establishment, which is why I feel like his best pick would have been like Ventura, who is been in the establishment, but he's still anti-establishment. You know what I mean? He used to be a governor, but he still rails against the system. Although he's an old white man, so that probably wouldn't work. But yeah, two wild white men and a ticket. Yeah. I mean, as non as a non Republican trying to gain different uh, sources of independent voters, that probably is not the smartest move. Um. Because right now, the biggest people that uh, RFK is peeling off from Democrats is actually, you know. Muslims or black Americans who are, you know, really not a fan of the establishment Democratic Party and, yeah. you know, the situation in Israel and the situation with student loans and all the sort of things and stagnancy and complacency that they perceive in the Democratic Party kind of pushes them against Democrats, but it doesn't push them towards Republicans who are obviously delusional and insane. So mm -hmm. they're kind of just stuck with somebody who has a name recognition and says, you know, reasonably anti-establishment rhetoric i have multiple normal ass democrat friends that are just mm -hmm. like young dudes that i work with normal good smart thinking people who are just like i'm considering voting for kennedy you know, <laughs> and I'm, yeah. I'm like i understand why with if you don't do enough research like we do into the actual reasons motivations be behind his rhetoric and the actual policies that he's going to follow through with it, you know, he's grifting. He's grifting for power. He's not really a genuine guy as much as people seem to perceive him. But, you know, if you're really grasping at straws for somebody who's not Trump or Biden, yeah, that's pretty much the choice you got. <laughs> so he pretty kind much. of is the non committed vote, essentially. So, and I think he's going to be the key to the election because every, it depends on if he gets a, on ballot access in Texas and Arkansas, but not in. Denver or not in Colorado or in Oregon or you know what I'm saying? I mean, ballots, are, I mean, I think it was on like what six ballots only. It, I'm pretty sure it's still at a low number, but we do have a lot of time until the actual election. So, as far as I know, unless I'm not sure when the deadline for getting on the ballot is, I but I think like, that's a key. Like in, like in the summer months. So we'll see how that goes. I feel like he's been saving his big. Um, I don't know his his whatever his strongest cards are, because he's got a lot of he he really does have a lot of celebrity endorsements, and I feel like if he starts getting some funds, he's gonna you're gonna see a lot more commercials of you know well known celebrities endorsing Kennedy, and that's mm -hmm. gonna change a lot of people people's minds, just people who just don't know about politics and are sick of the very obvious problem that is just a real re-election between trump and biden mm -hmm. so uh these numbers are terrible man you what know how many ballots this guy's on yeah he's struggling with ballot access huh he's on he's in eight ballots the libertarians have 37 <laughs> the no, no labels party has 22 hmm. the Green party has 21 interesting Constitution Party. I didn't know that was a party. That's oh, yeah. they're, they're far right. Fundamentalist Christian Party. Oh. The Robert F. Kennedy is eight, and Cornell West is on four. Hmm. So, and the four that he's on are not even in swing states. So, he's oh, on the Or Cornell West? Yeah. Yeah, Cornell West, I don't even know why he's running at this point. He yeah. should never have left the Green Party. No, he needs to stick to the Green Party at 21. I think no labels. Whoever is on that no labels ticket, yeah, man, they have a lot of. Okay, maybe of... That, maybe RFK isn't the uh, main factor. It's just gonna be third parties in general. 
Yeah, or, it's going to be – yeah, none of them are going to win, but they're going to need a lot of votes. And I think turnout is also a lot just of them. as key. Turnout is just as key as how many third-party people to take from. Because, you know, mm-hmm. Republicans are going to be – I mean, unless Trump really starts screwing the pooch by grasping for, uh, you know, donations to fund his, you know, legal bills – other than that, I feel like Republicans are going to stay pretty motivated to turn out to vote, even though Trump is shooting himself in the foot by like he stopped his team. That's like minority outreach. And he stopped like uh, pushing for early um, mail in voting. Like he's he's doing the same thing that got him made him lose in 2020. He's like, oh, we're going to we're not going to win by mail and voting we're gonna show up and vote our id blah 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 blah. stick to our values it's just gonna make him shoot himself in the foot i don't think trump's gonna win anymore i i just i just don't don't see how it's, he, it's was doing something, he was doing something when he was trying to court the black vote but then he stopped because his base yeah. don't like it yeah and then it was like well you're not gonna win so yeah. it's like you can't win an american election with only 50 percent of the population the it's Republicans funny. have done such a good job of consolidating their base, you know mm-hmm. what I mean, and having them all be on the same page. But then yeah. that's been that's been such a good thing for giving them some sort of unity and all this stuff. But it's been just detrimental to their uh, elect uh, their national electoral odds because mm-hmm. you know the more they cater to the far right and the conservative bases, the more that they lose at the center right and the independent voters. And it's yeah. it's really pushing them mostly in third party directions. But I mean, there's definitely a, most people would probably prefer if you don't already support Trump, you probably prefer Biden to Trump at the very least. There's probably a sizable version of that that just are like for some reason thinks they're exactly equally bad. Yeah, that's obviously a stupid opinion. But for the most part, people would still prefer Biden to Trump if they're not already Trump supporters. Yeah, of course. So I think that's all ultimately come down to again. And that's why it's going to be hard for him to win. If you're if you're banking on the fact that you get zero black voters, zero Latino voters, maybe you get the Cubans in Miami. Cause yeah, Cubans no, he's getting he's going to have more Latino voters than you think. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So he's probably not going to get zero because the, yeah. the, the Cubans, for some reason, love Trump. They Makes love no sense Trump. to me, but it, they do. It's because they're uh, the conservatives of Cuba who left the socialist Cuba for, you know, the free – Free market America, so they're super nationalistic and pro American yeah. Western values, all that stuff. But then again, they left a dictator to like another dictator, it doesn't make yeah, sense. no, yeah, it does. No. <laughs> the, yeah. the logic is just not there. No. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so so yeah, so he, he doesn't have a base. I mean, 30% of racist you know, <laughs> people yeah. and a couple of Cuban Latino voters, which at your very best day, let's say you get a million of them. Yeah, that's not going to swing an election your way. If you did you, if you already have Florida on lockdown, like yeah, you're going to win Florida. That's like no one, no one got that. So it's like it's not even a Democrats are not even counting on Florida. Yeah, in their, in their actual uh, the map that they think to win, mm-hmm. they're banking on Michigan and those in the northern states. They're not betting anywhere near Florida or Texas. They're just not. So isn't think, Trump the one who said he's gonna he said he's gonna win New Jersey and he's gonna all this sort of dumb shit too? So he's campaigning in like Virginia and New Jersey instead of the swing states because of his own delusions. Chris Christie hates he's never gonna oh, win New Jersey. No, of course not. New Jersey is incredible. I mean, they're they're they are like the wealthiest state in the union, something like that, yeah. per capita, at least top three. But they are very heavily Democratic voting, even if they're pretty much. I mean, they have one of the most n- notorious records of corrupt politicians. It's pretty yeah. hilarious if you look look into it. Like that's the Bob Menendez state. That's the state where Cory Booker replaced like a notoriously corrupt uh, politician. Like there's just they just have a real big problem with corruption. In New Jersey. Yeah, it's not like and that's probably why Trump thinks that he'd win. Yeah. <laughs> that happens uh Chicago too, huh? Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, man. Well, that brings us to our show, guys. Yeah. Well, you we'll learned about corrupt politicians. <laughs> you learned about corrupt politicians. Uh what else did we learn? Not to be racist. Don't be racist, guys. 
If you guys have a nice thing today, don't be yeah. racist. Don't be racist. It hurts um, you as much as everyone else. Yeah, it's not cool. Not cool, guys. No. Um, what else did we teach them today? <laughs> democracy Ooh. is, you know. Democracy is king. Democracy is a thing. <laughs> Fascism is on the rise globally. Yes. And, um, oh, and, you know, Israel, get your act together. Get your shit together, man. Come on. Yeah. Stop killing you're Palestine. You're hurting yourself as much as hurt, you're hurting others. Yeah, it's not cool. <laughs> That's really the lesson. When that is hurt, the lesson. When today, you hurt but... others, you hurt yourself. Yeah, I know. What so did you say? Others. Look yourself in the mirror, you know? Yeah. Before you judge others. We're all brothers and sisters. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, we love, we love having you guys on. Hope you guys learned something. We look forward to seeing you next week. And thanks for tuning in to Imagine More. Imagine More. All right, everybody have a great week.